And our first speaker tonight is Dr. Jeff Chen. Um, Dr. Jeff Chen is a graduate of the specialized dual degree MD and MBA program at UCLA. He has spent the last four years working in the intersection of academia, industry, and nonprofit sector and the government to accelerate cannabis research. Jeff has been invited to speak on the topic of cannabis policy, science, and business at institutions ranging from the RAND Corporation to the UCL Center of East West Medicine to the Senator's Feinstein's office. Dr. Chen was the founder and director of the UCLA Cannabinoid Affinity Group, compromised over 40 multidisciplinary UCA facilities. And Dr. Chen is David Geffen's fellow UCA Wolfman Entrepreneurial Award recipient and U.S. patent holder and a published author in cancer research. And he is a graduate, magnum cum laude, from Cornell University. Put it, please put, it, put your hands together for Dr. Chen. Thank you guys for having me. So uh, I, I flew in a few hours ago. I'm actually flying back out tonight, back to LA. And it was just a funny anecdote I was just thinking about. I, I live on the beach in Los Angeles. And uh, so I woke up this morning, went for a jog on the beach, jumped in the ocean, and then landed in Newark, got to Penn Station, and suddenly it's just like Frogger, and there's just like people left and right. It was a little jarring, honestly. But I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to talk about this. Um, you know, I, another 30 seconds about why I feel so passionate about this. So I, I first really got interested in this when I was a medical student at UCLA. And I was in my third year of medical school at UCLA, and I was on my pediatrics rotation. And I knew nothing about cannabis then. And, but I had one of, one of my patients was this little girl, and she was actually doing well. And her mother was telling me, you know, she used to have dozens of seizures at one point. And we started giving her something called CBD. This is four years ago. I bet you most people in this room hadn't even heard about it back then, much less me. And I had no idea what she was talking about. I thought, you know, this woman's kind of kooky. What's going on here? Nobody at UCLA was working on this. None of my professors knew what was going on. And the more that I read, the more enraptured I became in this. And I Googled it, saw these videos of all these other children. And that's when the light bulb went off in my head that I had kind of stumbled upon some hidden knowledge that nobody was really paying attention to. That's when I kind of set off dramatic, you know, I was going to be a neurosurgeon, dramatic tra trajectory change to the chagrin of my Asian tiger mom. Uh, <laughs> and actually, so that's when I also, while I was finishing up medical school, I went and got my MBA at UCLA so I could use those building blocks of business knowledge uh, to actually build one of the world's first research centers. And then we got some seed funding from the School of Medicine at UCLA. We got kicked off uh, last September. So um, that's kind of my backstory as to why we're here. But, you know, here I'm going to talk to you today about we're going to go through a 500 million year journey through time, talking about uh, some of the science and history of cannabis. And the, and the title of my talk is Cannabis as a Gateway Herb. Um, you know, it's been, it's been described as a gateway drug before, but hopefully by the end of this talk, we might start thinking of what other type of a, a, of a perspective and lens can we look at this. So first stop on our journey, we're going to go back 500 million years ago. And that is when we believe the endocannabinoid system first evolved in multicellular life. So who here before this talk uh, has heard about the endocannabinoid system? That's about half the room, okay? Endo-internal cannabinoid cannabis-like. So this is your body's own internal system of messenger molecules that resemble the stuff in cannabis, okay? We only discovered this uh, in the 1990s. So prior to that, we didn't really know why cannabis affected your body. But you know, scientists started thinking, well, if it affects our body, maybe it's because our body's already making something very similar. And the cannabis is simply mimicking that. And that's when we found the endocannabinoid system. Okay? And uh, the system is very primitive. It's very widespread as well. So we used to think it was just in your brain, where it regulates neurotransmission, mood, memory, sleep. But it's also on your immune cells, where it regulates immune function. It's in your fat cells, where it regulates energy storage. It's in the lining of your blood vessels, where it regulates blood pressure. It's in your bone, where it regulates uh, remodeling of your, of your bone tissue. It's in your skeletal muscle. This stuff's everywhere throughout your body. Okay? And it comes as no surprise, then, that the endocannabinoid system is not just limited to humans. Right? So why don't you guys toss out some little critters you can think of, and I'll tell you whether or not they make endocannabinoids. Dogs. Turtles, yeah. Toitles make endocannabinoids. Dogs, yeah, for sure. Cats, for sure. Keep going. Let's get weirder. Let's get weird, guys. 
sharks make endocannabinoids. Narwhals make endocannabinoids. In fact, snakes make endocannabinoids. Anything with a vertebra makes endocannabinoids. Microscopic nematode worms make endocannabinoids. The system is 500 million years old. It's a very ancient, primitive system. Okay, so it's not just humans. And it comes as no surprise that the system is involved in so many processes and so many different organ systems in your body that it comes as no surprise that if we could figure out a way to modulate, to manipulate endocannabinoid system activity, we could theoretically be impacting every single, almost every single disease known to mankind. Right? And this is not, these are not my words. This is research we're doing at our own country's National Institutes of Health. Now, cannabis or uh, cannabinoids, they are modulators of your endocannabinoid system, but they're not the only one. Right? I, it, I, people are always like, you know, cannabis is the only solution. No, it's one of many solutions. Exercise can change your endocannabinoid system. Diet can change your endocannabinoid system. Other botanical products can change your endocannabinoid system. Cannabis is a modulator, but it's one of many. Okay, so let's not be confused about that. Um, all right, so that's 500 million years ago. When do you guys think the cannabis plant evolved? How long ago? So, trillion years. Trillion, not, that's not, not too quiet. Not, not quite. 3,000, keep going. 50,000? 50 million, 50 million, that's about right. 40 to 50 million years ago, this little critter shows up on the, on the planet. And it makes compounds, it makes a, a unique category of compounds called cannabinoids. So the cannabis plant makes cannabinoids, we make endocannabinoids. And so looking at the timeline, the endocannabinoid system came first, then cannabis popped up. Because I've heard some people be like, oh, we evolved to, our bodies evolved to use cannabis. No, 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 it's, it's the other way around, right? And uh, there's compounds like THC, the principal psychoactive ingredient. There's also compounds like CBD, non-psychoactive. But there's also over 100 other cannabinoids, this family of compounds, and we've only really studied maybe half a dozen of them. What did the other 97 do, right? And THC and CBD, they have uh, similarities. Um, uh, actually, they have, they have a lot of distinct differences, right? So THC, psychoactive, CBD, non-psychoactive. THC impairs motor function. CBD doesn't seem to impair motor function. THC has addictive potential. CBD, no addictive potential. In fact, there's emerging research. There's a lot of interest right now in the anti-addictive properties of CBD. So those are areas where they're different, but they also have overlapping features. They're both anti-inflammatories. They both exhibit antioxidant properties. They both exhibit uh, anti-tumor properties and anti-seizure properties. So in some areas they overlap, other areas they're very, very distinct, okay? So, oh, and there's another whole category of compounds of cannabis called terpenoids, uh, terpenes, and these are responsible for the aroma. Um, and these are un not unique to cannabis. They're found in all sorts of other plants. Cannabis just tends to produce a very wide range of terpenes, okay? So that's, that's the difference there. All right, so 50 million years ago, cannabis evolves. Uh, about 5,000 years ago is when we have some of the first written recorded uses of cannabis as medicine. And, and where in the world do you think that popped up? China. Not Egypt. China. China. My people. <laughs> um, uh, this, this guy, my great, 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 great grandfather, um, <laughs> Emperor Sheng Neng of China, first documented the medical uses of cannabis. They would make he described it uh, as, a, as a, a tea of some sort. But, you know, if you read some of the historical documents, there's this interesting story where one of his court officers was like, Emperor, how is it that you discovered the medical properties of cannabis? And to that, Emperor Shangne responded, Well, I, I smoked, but I did not inhale. <laughs> well, actually, I, I inhaled, and th that was the point. So... <laughs> I'm glad you guys like that. It's, it's the only reason I flew over for that, just to give that one joke. All right, so that's 5,000 years ago. 150 years ago is when cannabis goes from Asia to the Middle East to Europe to the Mediterranean, Northern Africa, finally makes its way over to the U.S., where 170 years ago, it's officially entered into the U.S. pharmacopoeia, where it's recognized as an official medicine, along with all of these use cases, okay? 
And so this is when doctors start prescribing cannabis for all these conditions. And there's a few of these on here that maybe we weren't, we were a little misguided on. It wasn't accurate. But there's a few that I want to draw your attention to. And the reason I want to draw your attention to that is because today, 170 years later, we're still having this debate. What does cannabis do to alcohol consumption, opioid consumption? Is it good for seizures? Is it good for pain? This is not new knowledge. We were already, we knew, we saw something 170 years ago. And as recently as about 80 years ago, doctors still in this country prescribed cannabis. And you would go to a pharmacy and you'd pick up a cannabis tincture manufactured by some of today's largest pharmaceutical conglomerates, such as Eli Lilly. Right? This is not ancient history. This is 80 years ago, we were still doing this. So it was recognized as medicine. Okay. But then after that, there's a period of prohibition that I'm not going to get into today. You can read about why it got prohibited. But really, if, if you think about it, cannabis being illegal, it must be because it's harmful at its core. Right? So let's, let's talk about that for a second. So here's some of the deaths caused every year, American deaths caused every year by some common substances in society. Uh, tobacco is still the number one killer by a huge margin. Alcohol kills a lot of people. Opioids, the reason people are so concerned about opioids, not because of the total amount of people dying, but the, the growth rate, it's going exponential, it's very scary. Um, even things like NSAIDs, these are things like Advil, ibuprofen, things that you give your kid, things that you give your elderly parents, they kill a few thousand Americans a year. Now, what does that number look like for cannabis? Zero, right? And, you know, the reason I put a question mark is let's, let's, not, let's not be confused here, right? It impairs your driving. So I'm sure there's some people that got stoned and crashed their car. And that's serious. And I'm sure there's some people that got so high that they ate so much Nutella that they died <laughs> of chocolate, Nutella. <laughs> His stomach exploded and just Nutella everywhere. I'm the first doctor to describe this condition, actually, okay? But, okay, all jokes aside, there's a very serious number that I don't think people are talking enough about when it comes to the harms of cannabis, and it's this number right here. It's 118, 721. And those are the amounts of lives of Cheetos lost every minute because of the harms of cannabis. It's a travesty. It's an epidemic, and nobody is doing anything to protect Cheetos from the harms of cannabis. Okay, all right. Now, seriously though this time, let's talk about the real harms of cannabis. There are real harms that we should be aware of. Number one, schizophrenia and psychosis. There's pretty good evidence that if you have a genetic predisposition to cannabis and you smoke, particularly when you smoke heavily and young in life, you're going to go from a predisposition to full-blown schizophrenia, right? You're going to increase your odds of that happening. That's serious. This is a very serious mental disorder. Pregnancy, we find that women that smoke cannabis while they're pregnant, they tend to give birth to babies that have lower birth weight. It's also serious. We know that birth weight of a child is directly correlated with its health and its long-term um, trajectory. What about cannabis use in adolescence, right? We find that people that use cannabis uh, uh, in their adolescence, it's associated with lower socioeconomic achievement, lower education, lower IQ. Okay, and you know, young people, the brain's developing. How, how, how long do you think the brain develops until? What age? Wow, you guys are good. Yeah, this is, this is, you learn something in those D.A.R.E. programs. Uh, yeah, 25 years, right? So the developing brain shouldn't be using cannabis. It shouldn't be using alcohol. It shouldn't be using tobacco. It shouldn't be using phones, really. We don't know how that's affecting development. I'm dead serious. That, that there's, something's going to come about of that. All right, let's talk about addiction. So I hear all the time, cannabis isn't addictive, or maybe it's just psychologically addictive. And I want to dispel that. Cannabis is addictive, both psychologically and physically. There are not everybody, but a small fraction of people that use a lot of cannabis, if they suddenly stop, they will go into withdrawal symptoms. That, by definition, is physical dependence, right? Okay? Now, I will say with the caveat that the lifetime risk of cannabis addiction from someone who uses, it looks like it's about 9%. That same number for alcohol, it's about 15%. Heroin, 23. Nicotine, 32%. Nicotine, the most, 
most addictive compound known to man. But a 9% is not zero. So you could say with reasonable certainty that it's not as addictive as some other things, but it's not zero. All right, let's talk about driving, right? You have about, as far as we can tell, you have about a doubling of your risk of car accident when you're stoned. And that's serious, but compared to alcohol, though, that, for alcohol, that number is about 6 to 8x increased risk of uh, crash uh, when you're over a BAC of 0.08, okay? So again, it's, it's not that it doesn't have any effect on driving. It definitely impairs you. Maybe it doesn't impair you as much as alcohol. We really got to look at these things with two lenses, okay? But those are the harms. And you have to take all of these things with another grain of salt, which is that in all of these studies, they're predominantly looking at people who are using high THC cannabis, not just high THC, one, predominantly THC cannabis. Number two, they tend to smoke it. And number three, they're using it with a recreational intention, generally. But what that means is, do we expect, can we, can we necessarily say that these same effects might be seen if you're using high CBD cannabis? Maybe you're not smoking it, maybe you're eating it. Maybe your intention is medical use and the dosing is different, right? You're taking in a regimented dose and you're not taking a high dose, you're taking a low dose, right? So we got to take all of this into consideration. And that naturally leads me into a discussion of the medical potential here, right? And I've just highlighted some areas where there is immense medical potential of cannabis. And it's everything from chronic pain and opioids, which is an area that at UCLA we're very engaged upon, all the way to cancer, epilepsy, autoimmune disorders. Remember I said you're, you have cannabinoid receptors on your immune cells. When they're stimulated, your immune cells decrease their activity. So that's great for autoimmune disorders, things like lupus, Crohn's, um, Alzheimer's, right? Cannabinoids are, are neuroprotective, okay? So I want you, uh, let's do a thought experiment right here. So let's say you were a room full of investors and I told you that I had a patented molecule that I made in my lab and in preliminary studies, it's shown that it could benefit everything from chronic pain to epilepsy to killing cancer cells to PTSD. It sounds pretty fascinating. You'd want to invest, right? Okay, now what if I told you it's actually a plant that nobody can patent, that nobody can own, that is inherently democratized and generic, inherently scalable around the world when you throw a seed in an envelope? Do you still want to invest? And so that, that's the difficulty here, is that when we're trying to research this stuff, you can see that there isn't a lot of, the traditional pharmaceutical model falls apart. And while it might be bad from an investment standpoint, it might be good from a societal standpoint that you have something that is democratized and generic. But there's a problem here before we can realize this medical potential. And the problem is, cannabis is a Schedule One drug. It's defined as the most dangerous drugs in America, they have no medical use, and they include drugs like heroin. So as a researcher wanting to study a Schedule I drug for medical use, can't really get federal funding, and it's incredibly difficult to actually do the work. Now, just to highlight the absurdity here, Schedule II drugs include things like cocaine and methamphetamine, and these are defined as having some medical use. Right? And as a consequence of this, there are people being harmed, right? So who, who here recognizes this girl? Charlotte Figge, right? She's this, the, the Sanjay Gupta CNN documentary from 2012. And, you know, she was having seizures, parents gave her CBD, saved her life. So the question you might be asking yourself is, over the last 70 years of prohibition, how many other children like Charlotte have suffered needlessly and even died? Because we couldn't do research, we couldn't understand this. There was no way to fund the work, even if there were brave researchers that wanted to do this. How many people will continue to suffer like this, like Charlotte and her families and her parents? Now, on the flip side, we have the exact opposite, which is because we can't do this research or it's so difficult, we have people with seemingly miraculous stories. Cannabis cured my mom's cancer. Cannabis, you know, got my dad off opioids. It fixed the fungus in between my big toe and my other toe, right? And that's harmful too because you have people who might be giving up a potentially effective therapy because of this kind of blind reliance on cannabis. 
And that's harmful too. So what we don't need is pro-cannabis research or anti-cannabis research. What we need is science. What we need is the truth. And that's why we created the Cannabis Research Initiative at UCLA. And our mission is to do some of the world's first human studies on the health effects of cannabis and finally bring light to this area, right? What types of cannabis, at what dosages, delivered in what method, for what type of person, with what type of disease could benefit them, or in what cases could actually harm them. And I want to highlight a few areas that's going on in society right now where I think our, this research could be particularly impactful. So, our country is in the midst of the worst opioid epidemic in history. An American is dying every 10 minutes. So while you sleep, while you eat, while you sit there on your phone, every 10 minutes an American is dying. And it's growing exponentially. And in fact, to put it in a different comparison, last year alone, the amount of Americans that died from opioids in one year was roughly the same amount of Americans that were killed in the entire Vietnam War. And it's growing exponentially. Moreover, the ones that didn't die, we have millions of Americans who are addicted to opioids. And that's also growing. Okay. So, why is cannabis interesting? There is substantial evidence it can be useful for chronic pain. Number two, there's emerging early evidence that can reduce the amount of opioids that people consume. Number three, certain cannabinoids like CBD, these anti-addictive properties that it has, might be another way that can actually help people end the cycle of dependency. And so I just want to put things in a different context. Okay, so. $20 million, that is roughly the total amount of funding in US history that has gone towards controlled clinical trials of cannabis for medical use. History of America, 20 million. All right, multiply that number by 100,000% and you get roughly $20 billion. And that's the amount of opioids legally sold to Americans every year. 100,000% in one year. Take that number, multiply it again by 10,000%, and you arrive at about a trillion. And that is the current, already incurred economic toll of the opioid epidemic. And it's growing exponentially. So a question you might ask yourself is, if 50 years ago, there had been funding mechanisms for this research, and there had been support for this research, would we be in a situation where an American is dying every 10 minutes and there are three million Americans addicted to opioids with no end in sight? Let's talk about another condition, cancer. I got some bad news. Half of the men in this room and a third of the women in this room are gonna develop cancer in your lifetime. Cannabinoids are interesting. There are three mechanisms. And, and again, huge caveat. This has only been really done in animal studies. We have no idea what this looks like in humans. But it can trigger cancer cells to self-destruct. It can starve cancer cells by cu cutting off their blood supply. And it can prevent cancer cells from spreading. This is both THC and CBD and some other cannabinoids as well. Okay? So here's another interesting fact you might not realize. Uh, this is not new information. This was first reported in 1974 at the Medical College of Virginia. And those results, it was so scandalous, and it was so difficult to do follow-up studies that it wasn't until over two decades later that a different group of researchers tried to look at this again, the ability of cannabinoids to be anti-tumor. Those 20 years went by without any more research in this country after that first blip on the radar. And the other thing is, you know, let's set this aside. This is so early. This is animal data. Let's talk about quality of life in cancer. Nausea, weight loss, issues with pain, issues with uh, anxiety, things like that, that cannabis could conceivably help. And at the end of the day, this is a democratized, cheap, scalable product. 
I think that's exciting. All right, last thing, uh, dementia. We talked about the opioid epidemic. We have a dementia epidemic coming. And by 2050, half of all senior citizens, when they die, they will die with dementia. And there's a few mechanisms through which cannabinoids might help. These things are anti-inflammatories. They're antioxidants. They're neuroprotectants. They're also able to potentially uh, break down the, the amyloid plaque that builds up in Alzheimer's. Again, these are like cell and animal studies. We have no idea what they look like in humans. But this deserves research and attention. And again, what, do, what are some, for those who might have parents with dementia, what are some symptoms that people from dementia suffer from? Health-wise, they have poor sleep, they don't eat, they're agitated, they're anxious, they're depressed. If they're elderly people, maybe they just have pain, arthritis. And sometimes the meds that we give them can actually worsen their cognitive function. And again, you don't have to take my word for it. Um, in fact, the US government owns a patent on the use of cannabinoids for neurodegenerative diseases. So this is a patent that the US government filed 15 years ago. The Department of Health and Human Services to this day owns this patent. And if you read the body of the patent, the title is Cannabinoids as Antioxidants and Neuroprotectants. And it specifically mentions the utility of cannabinoids for diseases like Alzheimer's. You can go look it up, read about it on your own. 15 years ago. All right. How do we, so how do we engineer a solution to this? There's a, there's a few ways to do this. So the very first thing is we need to fundraise to support, we need to build infrastructure, okay? Once we have infrastructure, the next thing that we actually have to do before we start going into multi-million dollar clinical trials, we have to actually crowdsource data. Here's why. There's never been a situation before where there has been research banned on a compound that is now so widely used because states have taken it up amongst themselves. So what that means is the people's usage of this product can actually accelerate our understanding of it if we can just learn from them in a rigorous fashion. So that's we can crowdsource this information and shave years or even decades off this pace of research. Okay. Once we have all this data, we can start identifying what cannabinoids to go after, what dosages, what diseases, what subtypes of diseases, and what types of people. And once we have this information, then we can crowdfund the multi, multi million dollar clinical studies. And that's because at the end of the day, the funds that go into these studies, you're not producing something that belongs to a company. You're producing something that is democratized. And the best part is the impact is immediate. So in pharmaceutical drug trials, on average, how long does it take for a pharmaceutical drug to go from lab to pharmacy? 10 years. And all along the way, during those 10 years, papers are being published that are promising, but people don't have access to the product. But cannabis is different. It's already in the public domain. So the day we publish promising research, there's immediate impact. There's immediate change in patients, change in the physicians, change in policy. We don't have to wait 10 years. So who recognizes this gentleman? Jonas Salk. What did he do? He went to the polio vaccine. And uh, there was a radio show he was on where the host was asking him, Dr. Salk, who owns the, the vaccine? And he, and he pauses kind of perplexed and he goes, well, the people do. Could you patent the son? And that's why going back to the, the title of this talk, right, there's been to date, there's been no evidence to prove this notion that cannabis is a gateway drug. And I'm actually here to put forward this notion that cannabis might be a different type of gateway, and it's a gateway herb, right? It's a gateway into a paradigm shift in both how we research and how we utilize everything from food to botanical products. And there's this notion in, can in, in the cannabis scientific realm of the entourage effect. It's just, a, it's just a theory. And it's this, it's this notion that the combination of, of things in cannabis, these dozens or even hundreds of active compounds, are able to offer a superior effect 
than any individual cannabinoid. Okay? But if this, this is a theory, but if it's proven true, you've just turned the whole Western pharmaceutical paradigm inside out. And again, this is not a ludicrous notion. It's the same reason why whole foods are better for you than a processed food bar that has all the essential carbs, fats, vitamins. It's not the same thing, though. And so, you know, if you look at nature, right, fifth, over half of all pharmaceutical drugs were first found in nature before they were copied, patented, resynthesized, and slightly modified so that there could be intellectual property around them. And so nature is the greatest factory of medicine. And so if we can just align around this notion, if we can just fund the research, if we can do the good science, we might actually figure out at the end of the day what cannabis truly is. And it's, an, and it's, it's a fascinating way that we might open a whole new paradigm into how we utilize everything from botanical medicines to uh, whole foods for, as, a, as a critical part of health. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for having me.